So here's the deal. Lightburn can be an overwhelming piece of software to learn, especially if you consider yourself to be a non-technical person. And now that I've been using Lightburn professionally for over a year now, there's a bunch of things that I wish that I would have known at the beginning that would have made everything in Lightburn much easier. So today I'm gonna share all those Lightburn tips with you and they're organized roughly in the order in which I would do them. Here I am in Lightburn and tip number one is to set it and forget it. And in this case, I'm actually referring to the Lightburn settings. So personally, I spent several months, many months actually, actually being kind of uncertain about what I needed to do with Lightburn settings. And this caused me a lot of unnecessary confusion and stress until finally I did a bit of a deep dive to figure out what settings in Lightburn I actually needed to pay attention to. As a result, I recommend that pretty much every new Lightburn user spend a little bit of time figuring out these two things right here, which are the general settings here in Lightburn, and also the little uh, wrench is the device settings and just kind of figure it out once so that you can set it and then not have to worry about it again in the future. And of course, you can always come back and change these later. For example, you might want to at some point change the size of your working area, which is found here if you want to add an extension to your laser, if that's an option for you. And there's other things that you might want to change in the future, but I find that it is still helpful to just set it up with a baseline and then leave it like that until you have a reason to change it again in the future. I think this can really be a load off the minds of beginners when it comes to Lightburn. And if you need help with this, I actually made a video that does go through the different Lightburn settings that I use. And so if you wanna find that, I'll leave a link to it in the description. Tip number five is to understand the five zones within Lightburn. If you look inside the Lightburn software like we are right now, I like to conceptualize this as five different zones that you're gonna be interacting with to make your designs and projects. And before I tell you what the zones are, I should first tell you that I did make them up just to make Lightburn easier to digest. The software company that makes Lightburn probably wouldn't use the exact same terms that I'm about to use, but I still think the five zones is helpful, especially for beginners because it simplifies what would otherwise be a pretty overwhelming number of options. With that all said, zone number one is actually the workspace, which is this grid area here where you'll be making your designs. The second zone is over here on the left-hand side, this menu here, which contains all of the primary design tools, like making rectangles, the tools for making arrays, merging things, uh, the node editor is over here as well. Basically anything you would use to make a visual design in Lightburn, most of those tools are gonna live right here on the left-hand side. The third zone is what I call the top menu, and that's everything that's going on up here. And just to make things easy to grasp, I like to split this down into three different parts. The first part is everything from these little file open tools all the way up to the left of the little uh, guy icons here. So this three little dots, everything to the left of that are kind of your admin tools, which is where you uh, open files, save files, undo and redo, and a bunch of little things that I kind of group into the category of admin stuff. The second section of the top menu is everything at the top to the right of those three little dots. So we have group and ungroup, the mirror buttons, some alignment tools. These are basically additional design tools that you might use in your workspace while you're putting together the pieces of your final design. The third part of the top menu is what I kind of call the precision editing tools. So that is everything in this bottom section here of the top menu where you can set the exact X and Y coordinates of your design. You can also manipulate the exact size of your design. For example, I could change this to 200 and change my design here. And it also has all of your font settings that's kind of the three parts of the top menu. The fourth zone is over here on the right hand side. And this is what I typically refer to as the laser menus, because this is where you'll find your actual laser controls like the frame, pause, stop, start buttons, as well as your layers. And if you go to the red heading and right click on it, there's actually a bunch of other uh, menus that you can open here just by clicking on the corresponding box. So those are the laser menus. And as you can see here, they can be moved around. I'm just showing them as a zone on the right because this is, I believe, where they show up by default. And the fifth zone is the layer buttons down here at the bottom that we can use uh, to select one of our shapes or, or the parts of our design and then just assign a layer to it like so. So this is a pretty straightforward one. It's just the layer buttons make up the fifth zone. And if you wanna learn more about all of these different menus, then you can go and watch my Lightburn 101 video, which goes in more depth on these types of things. So I'll also leave a link to that in the description below. Tip number three is just to avoid common pitfalls. Some of the classics include getting stuck inside of a design tool. So for example, let's say you have the circle selected. 
Uh, a lot of people, as they're getting started, don't know that if you don't unselect that, that tool, you'll just keep creating these shapes forever. You won't actually be able to click on anything and select it because you're just creating a lot of these shapes. And so to get out of that, the easy escape is just to hit the escape key twice. And that'll get you back to your selection uh, tool where you can actually click on things and manipulate them. Another common issue is not really being able to move well around the workspace. And so for example, what you might wanna do just intuitively is to click and drag to move around the area. But if you do that, what you're getting is a red or a green rectangle. And that is actually the selection tool, not how you move around the space. And so let's say we wanted to move to the left-hand side of our workspace. Well, there's two easy ways of doing it. The first one is to just hold your space bar and then you can click and drag. And the other one is to zoom in and out with a scroll wheel mouse. So I'm using a, a mouse here that has a scroll wheel. And what you can do is zoom out by scrolling away from your computer like this, and then to just point at the area you wanna to go to. So let's say the left-hand side here, and then to scroll towards your computer to zoom in. That's another easy way to move around. And if you wanna know what some of the other pitfalls are that a lot of beginners fall into, then you can go and watch my Lightburn Mistakes video, which I'll also link to in the description below. Tip number four is to begin thinking in layers. So for example, let's say you wanted to make a framed little engraving project like we did in my last video. Well, in order to do that, you actually need to make a Lightburn file that's made up of three different layers. And so those layers here, just as an example, are one layer for the engraving, which is what you see in blue, one to cut the outline around that engraved piece, and then you also need another one for the, the dark walnut outline that makes up the, the outline of the frame here. And so that is a third layer, which is also a cut. But at the end of the day, thinking in layers is really just the same as breaking down projects into smaller pieces. And in Lightburn, those pieces are called layers. And in my opinion, the best way to develop this skill is really just to make some projects. So if you need some inspiration for projects to make, then I'll leave a link in the description below to my email newsletter where you can get a list of 51 different laser projects product ideas for inspiration to give you a jumping off point to find some projects to do yourself. Tip number five is to master the material test generator, which can be found under laser tools, material test. If you can master just this one tool in Lightburn, you will instantly be ahead of the vast majority of laser users. And if you're not already familiar, a material test grid just looks like this. And this is what you use to get the proper power and speed settings for your machine and your projects. And as you may have seen, it's very common in Facebook groups and also on online forums for different laser users to ask other people for their power and speed settings. And I am all for people in the community helping each other out, but the problem with that is you might have a 40 watt laser and the person you ask might have a 10 watt laser. So if you copy those settings from a 10 watt laser, it's not gonna work on your 40 watt and it could even be dangerous. And even if you happen to find somebody that has the exact same laser as you do, there are other variables that can throw things off and make it so your results aren't quite right. For example, the age of each machine, the source of the materials, as well as even things like the humidity in each shop are all variables that can also affect the outcomes, even if just slightly. As a result, I think every laser user needs to spend a little bit of time learning how to do their own power and speed test grids. And Lightburn's built-in material test generator that we see right here is the easiest way to do that. And if that goes just a little bit over your head, then don't worry because I've actually made a crash course into power and speed tests here on YouTube, which I'll link in the description below. And if you happen to be in my Diode Laser Bootcamp program, then you can get uh, both a step-by-step -step walkthrough on material tests, as well as my downloadable presets uh, to make getting these things dialed in a little bit easier. Tip number six might be a little bit controversial, but I think most beginners should just start with one material. In other words, don't try to learn to work with a dozen different materials all at once at the beginning, because you're likely to get bogged down in the minutia of testing, and it'll take you a lot longer to start actually making real projects. And personally, I really only used one category of materials on my laser for the first full year of laser engraving, and that was wood and plywood. In fact, my wife and I grew a laser business from zero to all the way over 6K in revenue per month just using wood and plywood materials. We did of course use some other supplies like hardware and wood stain, but other than that, everything we ran on our laser was just wood products. And if you're not sure what material to start with, I do think that wood or plywood is a really good place to start. However, it does depend a little bit on what you're going for. And I think that acrylic and also glass can be other good materials to start with. And tip number seven is to make three projects as soon as you possibly 
possibly can. And there's nothing magical about the number three. The idea is just to make some real projects as soon as you can. Because the sooner you can make some real projects, the faster you will get confident with using your laser. But I also understand that doing the first few projects can be really challenging. They definitely were for me. The good news is there are a couple of things that you can do to make that process easier. First, there is no shame in using pre-made designs for your first few projects. In fact, the very first three or so projects that I made on my laser were Christmas gifts that I bought as pre-made design files off of Etsy. For example, this eagle design that I'm showing here was one of the first things that I made. And by running these first several projects, I learned a bunch of skills that I would also need in future projects that I design myself, including how to do material tests, how to frame projects on the work bed, and also that I needed to improve my ventilation system, and I also learned a bunch more just running these first few projects. And as you are getting started, just make sure that you're being mindful of laser safety. And if you happen to be using a diode laser, you can find some laser safety tips in a video that I've made previously, which I will also link in the description below. Tip number eight is to open files, don't import them. This is a pretty quick one, but if you have got some of those downloadable files that you wanna bring into Lightburn, maybe from Etsy or someplace like that, then what you wanna do is go to file up here and then go down to open. Don't use the import option because you actually could lose some settings there. And if you are a bit of a nerd like I am and you wanna know why those settings can be lost when you use import instead of open, then I'll leave a link in the description below to a Lightburn forum thread that kind of talks through it and it's pretty interesting. Tip number nine is another one that might be just slightly controversial and that is to learn one method of framing and to just stick to it. And for those of you who don't know, framing is basically what you do in order to get the material, so plywood for example, aligned on your laser bed such that it matches up with what you're trying to do in Lightburn. And so there's a few ways of doing this. We have our frame buttons here, for example, and tight end with framing is also the topic of coordinates. And so there's a bunch of different ways of doing this, and I actually show three different methods of framing in my Lightburn 101 video. And so I put a link in the description to that so you can see a few different options. But the tip is to just choose one and to stick to it, at least for your first several projects. You can always come back and learn more methods later, but I think it's helpful to just sort of narrow your focus a little bit so that you don't get overwhelmed by all the options. Tip number 10 is to always use the preview tool before running a project. If you haven't seen it before, this little screen icon here is the preview button, and what it does is it brings up basically an illustration of what your project is going to look like and how the laser is going to run, and it also gives you an estimate for how much time it's going to take. Using this preview tool has saved me from making a bunch of mistakes, and when I have forgotten to use the preview tool, I've actually ended up wasting a lot of perfectly good materials. And the fact that I've forgotten it, even after learning how important it is to use the preview tool, actually brings me to my next tip. Tip number 11 is to make your own built-in checklist. Most people don't even know that this exists, but Lightburn actually has a built-in feature that allows you to make a custom checklist that pops up each time you go to start a project. So this is just an example one here. It's reminding me to turn on my air assist, put on laser safety glasses, and so on. And so if you see this before you've actually started your laser, then if you've forgotten anything that's on your own personal list, then you can get a reminder to see it right there. And if you wanna learn how to set one of these projects up, then you can actually find out exactly how to do that by watching my video on the five most underrated light burn features, which I'll put a card to up right there. So just click on that little card, it'll take you right to that video and I'll see you over there. Bye now.